Hello, everyone, and welcome to another exciting workshop hosted and held by us here at Circuit Stream. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today on this VR Locomotion workshop. Now, I do want to be sure that you can all hear me and see me before I continue on. Hey, Josh, nice to see you in the chat. Could you please let me know in the chat box? Can you hear me and see me? I see Mike. Hello, Mike Curtis. Yes. Sure. Hello from Brooklyn. Stu, Kyle, Tyrell, Sahar. Wonderful. Hey, thank you everyone for letting me know that, that you can hear me and see me here. Now, I, I always love to ask this question to everyone who attends. Um, you know, we tend to have people joining us from all over the world. So I would like to ask you all, where are you currently tuning in from? Where do you live? Where are you coming and joining us from? I have Steve from Wyoming, some from Belgium, California, Brooklyn, uh, New York City, Germany, Berlin as well, Turkey, Seattle, Columbia, Newcastle in the UK, Chicago. So people from all over the world again. Um, and thank you all for, for joining us today on this workshop and webinar. Now, for all of you who are located abroad, I want to let you know this will all be recorded and sent out to you at the end of this workshop and webinar. So if you have to go have dinner, maybe wake up in the morning for work, no worries at all. We'll be sure to send you all of the information that we presented today that you can work with your uh, on your own time there. Now, a few housekeeping items before we continue and as we wait for some people to, to come and join us. As you see, there is a chat box there to the right. Feel free to network with each other, ask questions, add any comments you would like. Um, however, if you do have some questions for our team to answer live and at the very end when we have our Q&A session, there is a questions tab right beside that chat tab there. So if you have any questions, please toss them into the questions tab. It helps us see what questions have come in, uh, what we haven't answered, what we should wait for and answer at the end there. Really helps us organize those questions and be sure that we can cover as much as we can in this hour, hour and a half workshop and webinar. Um, and with that, beside the questions tab, there is a polls tab. And I will add polls throughout this entire workshop just to gauge the experience of the audience, uh, see where you are all at, how much experience you have in this, and so forth. But without further ado, let's get going and started with this workshop and webinar. Now, today is an exciting one. We're covering VR locomotion, so how to actually move in a virtual reality environment. And there's various ways to do this, from teleportation in the top left there that you see, to working on, or not working, but walking on special pads and platforms that can sense your movement, like the one in the top right, to simply using your joystick to move around an environment in that bottom left image, or even shaking your hands, moving your hands and bobbing your head to move through a virtual, in, a virtual reality environment there. Now, before we dive into VR Locomotion, this is what the agenda is today. I myself will be introducing you all to who we are and what we do here at Circus Stream, as well as a little bit about VR Locomotion. And that's gonna take about 10 minutes. Following that, I'm gonna invite my colleague onto the stage who's gonna go into depth about VR locomotion and actually helping you all create your own virtual reality project that, that includes the VR locomotion aspects we'll be covering today. After he's done his uh, presentation, I'll wrap up and offer some resources, which will take about five, 10 minutes, and then we'll open it up for a live Q&A session at the very end for any questions that we haven't gotten to throughout this workshop and webinar. Now, again, for all of you tuning in today, we are recording all of this and we will send it out to you by email. All of the project files and resources will also be sent out to you. So if you're new to this, you know, feel free to follow along with your own Unity and Visual Studio open, but I, I would say sit back, relax, watch how we approach it, ask questions in the chat if you have any questions. And if you do want to work with this on your own time, you can take that recording we send over and replicate exactly what we've done here. Now, a little bit about myself. So my name is Stefan, and I'm on the education team here at Circuit Stream. I have over seven years of experience in the tech industry, working with travel IT companies, learning management system providers, 
business integration and ERP platforms, and now in the world of virtual reality and augmented reality. A uh, little fun fact about myself, an icebreaker I like to toss in. We do, uh, I myself was a member of Water Polo Canada. I trained with the 2008 Beijing Olympic team. I never got to go to the Olympics, but it was a great experience nonetheless. Now today, it's a pleasure and an honor to have Tyrell Lewin join us and lead this VR locomotion piece that we'll get to in about 10 minutes here. Tyrell is our lead instructor here at Circuit Stream. He's also the CTO and co-founder of a couple of companies, namely Elucity. He himself has over six years of experience in the development side of things, over four years of experience as a tech artist, AAA gaming, and the little fun fact icebreaker about Tyrell here, he's six foot eight, used to play, N play NCAA basketball, and he can solve the Rubik's Cube in 20 seconds, 21 seconds if we round it up. But you know, maybe we'll have the opportunity for him to show us that later on in the workshop and webinar. Now, a little bit about us, who we are, what do we do here at Circuit Stream? Well, Circuit Stream was founded in 2015 when everyone was on the hype train to build their own contents and experiences. We noticed a gap in actually helping people learn how to create these themselves. And we understand this changes every year, the technology. And since 2015, we've taught over 30,000 people how to create and manage and implement both virtual reality and augmented reality experiences. Now, we're a team of about 15, 20 located all around the world, mainly in North America, but in South America, Asia, and Europe as well. Now, Circuit Stream is a Unity certified training partner. And training partners are approved based on their expertise, focus on quality education, and commitment to providing the highest level of training available. Circuit Stream is also a Unity certified channel partner which means we deliver training and application development services in the architecture, engineering and construction, automotive, transportation and manufacturing markets. Now, as I mentioned, since 2015, we've been holding courses to help people learn how to create both VR and AR experiences. And these are just some of our students and alumni coming from these companies that we've had the pleasure to teach and help learn to create their own experiences um, in VR or AR from Boeing, Raytheon, VMware, various post-secondary institutions, Hershey's, the chocolate company, Hulu, you name it. There's a lot of them out there that we've had the pleasure to have in our programs. Now we typically do this through two main ways. Our flagship XR development with Unity course, beginner friendly program, and I'll dive into this a little bit more. And those who are more experienced in this field and have some ideas that they want to really accelerate, we have our XR Project Accelerator program, which I'll touch on a little later as well. Now, what differentiates us uh, from some of the other providers out there? Well, it's really the one-on-one -on -one support and mentorship that every and each student gets in our two large courses where you come in with your own idea and project that you want to create. And as you're learning in our live classes, we support your idea and development alongside you through private weekly one-on-one -on -one sessions. So you'll have something to show for by the end of the course, your own prototype, something to add to your portfolio to work with later on. Now we do also have various individual courses or short courses in other words. And these cover specifically C Sharp, in Unity for those who want to get more confident in it. An introduction to XR design, so thinking about the design factors in any experience you create. We have Oculus Quest specific courses as well and HoloLens specific courses for anyone interested in device specific lessons there. Now, alongside education and training that we do here at Circuit Stream, we also do content creation and consultation. In other words, all of our instructors are current VR, AR developers, and they work with some of the companies that are presented here on the slide and build content, VR, AR projects for them to work at their workplace. 
So all of our instructors or current developers, everything they're doing today, like Tyrell, who will be joining us later, they bring what they're doing in today's work, bring it back into our courses and programs. So everything you're learning is up to date and relevant material applicable to today's work. Now, lastly, you know, we, we do education and training. We also do content creation. But the third thing that we also have here at Circus Stream is an XR platform that allows for people to host their VR, AR projects and applications on, scale, distribute, and manage those applications, as well as to track, measure, and analyze the learning activities that are happening in them. If you're interested in learning more, feel free to give us a shout. I won't dive into it too much in this workshop, but we'd be more than happy to speak to it more. Now, now that you've learned a little bit about us, you know what we do and who we are here at Circus Stream, what are you going to learn today? Well, today we'll be showing you how to quickly set up a project for virtual reality. We'll also go into the practical understanding of how to implement movements in your VR project. We'll be covering UX knowledge of moving avatars in VR environments, manually implementing your own VR raycaster, and adding clean fade in and fade out UX on teleportation that we'll be covering in that project in about five, 10 minutes here together. Now, go into that polls tab. I'm gonna toss in a poll here. And I would love to know from, from the audience joining us today, how much experience do you have with Unity on a scale of zero to 10. So check out that polls tab. I just pushed out the poll. Let me know, zero, never heard of Unity. 10, you're, you're a Jedi master in Unity, the Chuck Norris of Unity. You can come and teach some of our programs here. So I'm just looking at the results. We've got, uh, you know, I would say the majority of you are five and under, four and under, let's say. So some beginners here, but some people who are very familiar in this space and area. So super excited to help you all learn a little bit more about VR locomotion here. But for those of you who said zero, you know, what is Unity? Well, Unity is a free 3D development engine for building games, simulations, and experiences. It's the easiest way to begin making apps for XR. Now, XR stands for extended reality. And that's the umbrella term for VR, AR, and MR as well. It's just a simple term that encompasses this entire industry. And that's what we like to use here at Circus Stream as well. Now, how does one actually go about creating their own VR project, implementing locomotion or AR, let's say? Well, you have an idea and you bring that idea into a creation engine like Unity. And that's when you start developing it adding all these different features and coding for it. And once you've developed that in Unity or a creation engine, you push it out to an SDK for one of those devices or headsets that you would like to develop for. And I see Levi or Levy question here in the chat. That's a Microsoft HoloLens. Um, so this is specifically for augmented reality or mixed reality, not so much for virtual reality but the process is fairly the same. Idea into a creation engine, SDK out into any headset you would like to push it out for. But today is an introduction to VR locomotion, the art of moving in VR. Now I'm bringing back this slide here because I wanna just introduce you all to VR locomotion who are completely new to it. So what is VR locomotion? Well, VR locomotion is technology that enables movement from one place to another within a virtual reality environment. And locomotion through a virtual environment is enabled by a variety of methods, including head bobbing and arm swimming, swinging, as you can see in the bottom right there, uh, teleportation, as you can see in the top left, uh, as well as other natural movements that translate to in-game movements. But today we'll focus on that top left one. We'll focus on a project that implements teleportation, curved line renderer with a smooth teleport reticle and fade in and fade out from black there. Now, there's, there's a few examples of VR locomotion as we can see on the screen here. Now there's artificial locomotion, which involves the use of controllers to navigate through an environment. However, one problem with that method is that it tends to cause VR sickness or motion sickness 
by creating a discrepancy between what the user detects through vision and what the movement related systems within the inner ear detect. Now there's teleportation, uh, another mode of VR locomotion where the user might point to their desired destination and click on a button to automatically move there. In uh, room scale virtual reality, for example, the user might come to the physical limits of the room and choose to teleport to a different virtual location. So you don't have to run into walls if you're in your bedroom or office working with this uh, with, with a game that you're playing or anything that requires movement in VR. Now there's also special surf surfaces or omnidirectional treadmills that provide a, a surface that allows for users to move naturally within a restricted area while the platform feels or moves to conform to their direction of travel to enhance the illusion of unconstrained movement. And then lastly, uh, there's redirected walking, which allows people to move freely through a cleared space using various mechanisms to accommodate to the space's boundaries. Uh, for instance, there's walkabout locomotion where players will freeze the environment when they approach the boundaries. Let's say the one that the Quest or VR headsets have, when you step out of it, it will freeze your kind of experience you're in. But when you turn around, the game will unfreeze from the perspective of where you stopped, continue on, continuing in that virtual extended space. So essentially, what I want to get here is that unobtrusive and natural feeling locomotion is one element required for immersive VR to really help users engage fully with their virtual environment. But now that I've kind of introduced you to VR locomotion, I would love to take this time to invite my colleague Tyrell onto the stage here. Again, it's true honor and pleasure to have Tyrell join us, introduce you all to kicking, to kicking off your own VR project in Unity and applying VR locomotion. And uh, again, this will all be recorded and sent out to you. So if you're falling behind as you're working alongside us, don't worry. You can use that recording to follow on later on. We don't want to spend too much time redoing things because we only have about an hour, an hour and a half to work with. But Tyrell, thank you very much for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you. You're all in great hands. And uh, I'll be back in about 45 minutes here to wrap everything up and we'll open it up for our in-depth Q&A session. Thank you, thank you. It is a pleasure to be here as well. I am just going to get my screen shared so you guys have something to look at. Um, so I guess super quick intro, Steph covered it pretty well. Um, yeah, today we wanna get into VR locomotion and all the different things we can do with um, setting up our own teleportation. Now, these days with plugins, like back when I started VR, most of this stuff you had to create yourself. These days with XR Interaction Toolkit, VRTK, Oculus Integration, a lot of this stuff, to be honest, is already built for you that you can use. So today's uh, the purpose of today is really about the fundamentals. We're still gonna create it from scratch because that's still one of the best ways to understand what's going on, learn about it. We're gonna build the UX ourselves from scratch so that if you do end up using a different package, you'll be able to either A, add in your own extra feature, maybe you add in your package, but it doesn't have any smoothing on it. We're gonna get into smoothing today. Uh, maybe you'll add in your own package and it doesn't have a fade, or maybe it does, but it, the fade is too long or the fade is too short. So uh, we wanna give you that confidence to really understand what's going on from a fundamental standpoint. Maybe if you're more of a designer, give you an introduction to see what uh, creating these different UX elements are like in actual code. Um, and yeah, just give you the confidence to be able to dive into those types of things. Now, the other thing that I'll mention quickly is we don't have tons of time. Uh, there is a bit of code to get through. It's not too much, but uh, I do want to focus a little bit more on the explanation because what's harder to find out there, it's easy to find code. Code is everywhere. Uh, there's tons of implementations, but it's not easy to find the explanation of why this thing is the way it is or what the math is doing here, and uh, why it works this way. So I do want to spend a little bit of the time on the explanation. So the code for those of you who aren't that familiar with C-sharp might feel a little fast, but as um, Steph explained, it's all gonna be recorded. I even have it on a code share. It's already up on GitHub. Uh, so we'll be able to share all those things. And there's a big Q&A session at the end. So feel free. There is no stupid questions, no shame. Ask any and everything as soon as we get to um, the end. And there should be uh, some circuit stream members in chat as well, who if you do ask a question, should be able to uh, give you a hand with some of the stuff that happened. So, 
with that said, with that said, uh, I got a brand new project here. Uh, all this is, is 2019.411, brand new sample scene. I started with URP, but for those of you who don't know what that is, don't worry about it. Uh, it's not gonna be relevant to this project. Um, the only thing I've done here so far is it came with this sample scene. I just duplicated these floor, these ground tiles a couple times to make my floor a little bit bigger so we have space to teleport. And I have gone to window already and gone to the package manager and made sure to install XR plugin management. Just found XR plugin management under Unity registry and clicked uh, install right down there. Uh, on 2020, I believe this is installed by default already. And then I've also gone to the project settings and just clicked Oculus right here. So uh, you can get to project settings by going to edit project settings. I like to dock mine next to my inspector. These are all floatable windows. And I uh, just clicked on XR plugin management, the package I installed, and made sure Oculus is up and running. And already with my Oculus link here ready to go, as soon as I press play, I can actually see um, the camera in my headset. Now it's not a VR camera, uh, so it's actually a little disorientating. Uh, so let's make it a VR camera. So I'm gonna set up an XR rig as quick as possible. Again, a lot of these things you can set up from the XR Interaction Toolkit, but again, we're gonna do it from scratch uh, just to show you what that's all about. So here I've just created an empty game object. I'm gonna go up here and select XR, or I'm gonna name it XR rig, just like that. And then I'm going to create an empty underneath of it. So I'm gonna call this my VR head. Uh, like this, but I'm going to have a lowercase e. And I'm just gonna duplicate this empty object two times. We're gonna call this one left controller, and we're gonna call the next one the right controller. Now, of course, my VR head is indeed a camera, so I'm gonna delete the main camera out of the scene. And I'm going to add a camera uh, component just like that to here, and there we go. We already have a camera. Now, one thing about a VR camera, uh, the clipping planes, which is how uh, far the camera can see, I actually want to set that to as small as possible. So 0.01, uh, uh, Unity's uh, default measurements are in meters, so that will be one centimeter. So I'll be able to see something at least as close to my face as one centimeter. The default is uh, 30 centimeters, which is a little far for a VR camera. And now, uh, on all three of these, I'm just going to add a component called Track Pose Driver, which as long as you have those things installed, you will have. Now, track pose driver, we really don't have to set many settings on it, but this is what allows us to automatically track a headset. So now the headset or any XR device you plug in will automatically um, uh, tra uh, be tracked and uh, update the transform position. So we are gonna update the transform position of our camera with a generic XR device, tracking from the center of our eye. Uh, we are gonna track six degrees of freedom, both rotation and position, and we're gonna do it as much times as possible, both before the render and during update, and we don't need any relative poses. So both now on the left controller as well, I added it to here as well, so I'm gonna set this one to XR controller and left controller, all the same settings, six degrees of freedom, and finally for the right controller, I'm going to do that, uh, uh, set it to the right controller. Now, just for visualization purposes, just to make this a little bit easier for myself and for you guys, I'm just gonna add a sphere underneath uh, this hand, set it to 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1 in scale, so 10 centimeters scale, and I'm gonna add a cube underneath here. So basically what I'm doing is I'm just adding a cube underneath my right hand and a sphere underneath my left hand as a transform child so that um, it will be parented. So wherever my hands move, uh, these objects will move. So now, if I hit the play button, already we have VR set up in our project, ready to go. And you can see on my hands here, I have uh, a cube on my right hand and a sphere on my left hand. And you guys should be able to see that. So you can see how quick, I mean, that was maybe three minutes uh, and we have VR set up in our project, raring to go. So now, it's time to dive into um, some locomotion. So I want to be able to move in VR. So I'm gonna go to my scripts folder. I've already added a uh, script, but you can do that by just going create C sharp script, and then I will name it VR locomotion. I'm gonna attach that to my right controller. So right now I'm only going to be able to uh, teleport from my right hand. And that's not just because uh, my left hand controller is almost dead. That is also because from a UX perspective, usually it's good to have movement on only one uh, hand and use the other hand for something else. You don't really see too many games that have uh, movement controls on both hands. 
So this is a script. It's still pretty much a blank script. I've gone ahead and added a couple uh, functions, but you can see they're all empty still. Um, so this is usually what you'll start with in a blank Unity C Sharp script. Uh, and I've gone ahead and added a couple uh, headers here for the four things that we're going to try to cover today. So first thing is uh, teleport. So um, these are the things that we're going to need in order to teleport. So one of the main things we need to teleport in order to actually move the user around in VR, we need to get a reference to that top level XR rig transform that I created. So that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to create a public reference to a transform of, um, we're going to call it the XR rig. And so now I have a reference to the transform and I can move it wherever I want in C sharp. Well, I don't have a reference to the transform yet. There's a variable for it. And now when I go back into Unity with Alt tab, once the script decides to load, uh, we will have the XR rig right here. We can see that public variable exposed. And now I can just drag and drop the XR rig transform there like that. And now my script does have a reference to the XR rig. Beautiful. Now, the other thing we need is input. I need to be able to detect when I click the trigger, uh, where my stick is, when I click it in so I can rotate. So how do we do that? Well, we um, do what everybody does in this day and age, and we hop over to Google. And I type in, uh, well, you, you can get here, but all you have to do is type in Unity XR input like that. Very first thing that comes up. And this is for legacy input. So again, Oculus integration and some of the XR interaction toolkits, Steam VR, they have new ways of inputting. But again, the most basic bare bones, be able to do it yourself manually. You can come to here and it shows you the list of everything. So what I want is right now, I want the trigger button right here. So we can see trigger button is button number 14 and 15. Uh, you can see that uh, the left controller is the first number, the right controller is the second. So I want the right controller. So I want joystick, um, joystick button number 15. So I'm gonna go back to Unity and then I'm gonna go to my project settings. Remember, edit project settings. Hop over to the input manager, open the axes, and um, you can see there's a whole bunch of inputs in here already. I'm just, this is basically just an array, a list. I'm just gonna add one more number to this. So it goes from 30 to 31. And then we're gonna type in the name here. I'm gonna call this right underscore trigger, like that. The name is important. You can name it whatever you want, but just remember what you call it. I'm gonna get rid of the negative button there. The positive button, all lowercase, is going to be joystick button. 15, as we just saw from that chart. Uh, gravity is how quickly it falls back down. This really isn't that important for um, for buttons. This is more important for axes. Um, I'm still just gonna set it out of habit. Uh, and I'm going to select a key or mouse button. And that's all I need. So now my right trigger is set up, but while I'm here to save time, I'm gonna set up the other two. I also want to be able to recognize when the stick gets clicked in. And if we take a look at the chart, um, the primary stick, thumbstick click is button number eight and nine. So I'm also gonna set up a button number nine. So if we go 32, you'll notice uh, when you add another one, it just duplicates your last one. So I'm gonna rename this to uh, right stick click like that. And this is now uh, joystick button number nine and everything else there is fine. And then lastly, one more, I want the axis. So I wanna know is my thumbstick left or right when I click? So if we take a look one more time, the uh, joystick axes, primary axes is um, index, index number one and two for horizontal vertical and four or five for horizontal vertical of the right hand. So if I want the horizontal axes of my left stick, I want jo uh, joystick axis number four. So this one is ever so slightly different. Uh, so right stick is going to be, I'm just gonna call this right joystick like that. We don't want a positive button anymore. Uh, we do want a gravity of one, so just default, uh, it goes. It just falls back at a normal rate. We can add a dead zone of 0 0.05, so that's just in case there's a little bit of stick drift. If you have an old stick, small movements don't uh, add input. And I'm gonna change this to joystick axis, uh, and we said it was joystick axis number four. There we go. So I got all my inputs set up ready to go. So now I can go back to the code and I can actually use those. So on update, uh, let's first uh, work with the rotate function. Uh, so I can call uh, rotate every frame on update. And inside uh, the rotate function, uh, all we are going to do is we are going to check for some input. So uh, if we, so the input that we want to do is basically just going to be an if statement. So remember, this is running on update. So every frame, I'm going to check, hey, I'm going to go to the input class, so capital letter, 
function, so another capital letter, and I want to get a button down. So I want to know every time the button is clicked, what button do I want? Well, I want my right-hand controller. Well, if I want my right-hand controller, um, let's make this script a little bit more generic. Let's not hard code it in. So let's add one more uh, variable up top here that is going to be a public string. Um, we'll call this handness, uh, which we will set for now to right up here. But this way, we can add this to the left controller if we want and just change this to left, and we'll be able to use it. So really what we want is we want to get the button right uh, underscore stick click. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use string concatenation, which is just a fancy word for adding strings together. And so this is going to add handness, which is going to be right, but it can be left if we want to set it to something else. I'm going to add underscore stick click. So now this will work for uh, any hand that I add it to. Uh, so hand this plus stick click. So in this case, we're going to be getting the right stick click. And if this is the case, so uh, we can just say uh, check if button is clicked like that. If this is the case, we now want to determine uh, the rotation direction like that. The rotation direction, we can set it uh, as a local variable. We'll call it rot for rotation. And this is going to be, so I'm going to use a fancy uh, thing here called a question mark operator. So basically, I want to get a Boolean value. Um, so the Boolean value is going to be uh, input.get axis. We're again going to get handness plus underscore joystick like that. And we're going to check to see if that's equal to zero. So you're saying, what is this? Float? So it's a decimal number. And we're sending the decimal number equal to a Boolean expression. So we're getting the axis of our joystick, and which is the horizontal axis. And we're seeing, is it greater than zero? So if we go to the right, it's going to be positive one. If we go to the left, it's going to be negative one. So this will return true or false for if we're right or left. So what we can do with that is now we can type in a question mark. And we can say, hey, if this bool is true, then I want you to set it to a value of 30. Otherwise, I want you to set it to a value of negative 30. And so this just combines a Boolean expression, uh, which is basically a really cool way of doing, if my bool equals this, then set raw to that. Else, if my bool is this, then set my raw to that. And you can just do it all in one line. So that's what I'm gonna do there. And then we're very simply going to rotate the user. And to rotate the user, we already have the transform of the XR rig. So I'm just gonna go xrrig.transform.rotate and we're going to pass in zero degrees on X, rot amount of degrees on Y, and zero degrees in Z. And so we're going to rotate around the Y axis by third, positive 30 or negative 30 degrees, depending on which way they click. Awesome. So now we can rotate. Uh, but now we want to move. So we want to do what's known as a raycast. So in order to raycast, or what is a raycast? A raycast is basically what it sounds like. We are going to shoot a ray forward from our controller, and then we're going to try to figure out did we hit anything? And if we did hit something, we're going to figure out where it is we hit. So that way, it's basically a way to give us our, gives ourselves a little laser pointer in the virtual environment so we can point at things and teleport to where the user is pointing. So to create a raycast, we need two things. We need a ray and we need a hit info. So the ray we can create with a local uh, variable, ray equals uh, ray. Uh, and we're going to set it to new ray. This is the stuttering problem in programming. They say ray, ray equals new, new ray. Uh, and this ray is going to have a, a constructor where we can pass in an origin. So where does the ray start and what direction does it go? Well, this script is attached to my controller. So it's going to start at my controller, which is just transformed opposition, and it's going to go forward. So just transform dot forward. So start at my uh, create array that starts at my uh, controller and goes forward. Now we need a raycast hit info. So we're going to call raycast hit. So this is a struct that returns us uh, some information about the hit, which is really nice. So we can figure out where it hit and what object it hit. So I'm just going to create a new raycast hit. There's no arguments for this one. So just creating that new object. And now I can do my raycast. So the raycast works through the physics system. So we're going to get access to physics. And we are going to shoot our raycast like this. And we're going to pass in that right and go out hit info. So out is a very special keyword um, in C sharp, which just basically allows us to return two things. So by default, this function is returning a true or false value, which is why it's in an if statement. If this returns true, um, that means our raycast hit something. If it returns false, that means our raycast did not hit something. Uh, so we can say um, if hit the raycast returns true. 
Um, and then we can say code comes here if the raycast did not hit anything like that. And now we can uh, do another input check. So if we did, in fact, it's, oh, I didn't explain out. So out hidden info, what that's going to do is this allows us to return two values. So this uh, function raycast is already returning a true or false value. So this allows us to get some more information out. We can pass in a hidden info object, and it will pass it back out, out to us. So it can be really handy. Uh, and now we just need to do another statement. So we can just check, hey, did you press input.get button down? And did you press the same thing, handness plus underscore trigger? So we are going to be doing a raycast every frame. And if you did hit something with your raycast, we're now also going to check, did you just press the trigger? And if it is true that you just pressed the trigger, then let's go ahead and move you. So let's just go XR rig dot uh, position. Since XR rig is already transformed, we can access its position. And we can just set it equal to the hit info dot point. If you hover over point, it says this is the impact point in world space where the ray cast hit the collider. So basically, we shot out a ray, it hits something, and it put all that information about the hit into this object called hit info. And now we can get the exact point that it hit by going hit info dot point. And just like that, uh, we have ourselves basically the ability to teleport and rotate. But you don't have to believe me. You don't, you really don't have to believe me. I will instead, oh, I will take off my headphones because it's hard to put headphones over or underneath a VR headset. You don't have to believe me. I will show you. I will prove all the doubters, everybody wrong, prevail, and I will click my stick to rotate left and right and point at the ground. And, oh, uh-oh. <laughs> I guess the doubters were correct. Boom. Oh, uh, let me make sure I didn't give myself a reference to my XR rig, did I? Oh, I did right. Okay, and let's make sure the right trigger is set correctly. Right underscore trigger, joystick button 15, key or mouse button. Nice, joystick button 15 is correct. And, oh, we didn't call handle raycast, of course. There we go. We need to actually call our function every frame if we indeed wanted to handle the raycast. OK, I guess the doubters were correct. They were true. <laughs> From now on, the doubters have a right to doubt. And now when I pull the trigger, I can teleport around. So I'm pointing at the ground, and we are moving around. Fantastic. So. Uh, thanks for joining in in the XR uh, workshop. I think I'll be tuning out. And Steph, if you want to, no, no, just joking. Okay, so obviously we can move now, but the UX is horrible. So that's mostly what today is about, is about um, actually improving this UX so um, we can see, um, see actually what we're doing and make it a bit of a better experience for the user. So how do we start? Well. First, we need what's known as a line renderer. We want to show, It's so far, it's really hard to know where I'm pointing. So it's pretty hard to be accurate with it. So I'm going to go to my right-hand controller, and I'm going to add something known as a line renderer. Um, this line renderer is going to show up pink right now because it has no material right here. So I'm just going to go here, and I'm just going to type in line and set it to the default line renderer. I'm also going to go to this gradient, and I'm just going to make it a little bit uh, nicer so that uh, it has a fade, so at 15%, it's at full alpha, and at 85%, it's at full alpha, but at uh, zero, it's at 0% zero, uh, alpha, and at 100, it's at 0% alpha. So I will just fade it off at the beginning and end for me very nicely, and I'm also going to set the width of it to 0 point, uh, or point, or point, sorry, oh, wait, uh, uh, I got confused, point zero 0.05, there we go. Uh, so we have our line render set up, but uh, how does it know where to go or who to talk to? So that's what we're going to do next. We're going to set up that line renderer. So I am going to go back over to uh, Visual Studio. Uh, I'm going to add something up here that's going to say required component. And we're going to say type of uh, line renderer, just so that I can add this variable as an internal variable. And I can say private line renderer. And we're just going to call it LR like that for line renderer. So the reason I did this is so on start, every um, 
every time I call the start method, I can just go LR equals get component line render. So now this is guaranteed to not fail because there's always going to be a line render component on this object. So I can just set it in code. Uh, and we've, we know there's always going to be one because we made sure that this, this script, when we add this component, it requires that there's a line render component already on there. So now I can safely call this and I don't have to worry. I actually already created a function for this called initialize uh, render like that, initialize line render. So I'm going to put that in here like this. And now we want to uh, actually show that line renderer. So the other thing I'm going to do inside of initialize is I want to enable it uh, to false by default. So I'm going to turn it off to start the game. Uh, and I'm also going to set the position count. So how many points are in this line renderer? This idea of um, positions in the line render is going to be important for us when we start getting to curve lines. Uh, but I'm just going to set it to two. So I want one point at the start, one point at the end, and it will draw a straight line between those two points for me. And then we're going to head down to um, we're going to head down to uh, our handle raycast function, and we're going to do a couple things. So we're going to say lr dot enable equals true. So if you actually hit something, we're going to turn on the line renderer, and then we want to set the color. So we need to first check if we hit a valid target. So I'm just going to very quickly go back to Unity. I'm going to add a tag called a ground tag. So I'm going to add tag here. We're going to name this ground like that. And then on each one of these ground pieces, I'm going to make sure it has a tag of ground so I can recognize what things are ground and what things are not. I'm just going to make sure that this wall, because it usually doesn't, has a box collider so I can show you the difference. Uh, remember, this thing, uh, the Raycast works with the physics engine. So if things don't have a box collider on them or a collider of some sort, they won't be able to interact with them or hit them. So now what we're going to do is we're going to check to see what object we actually hit. So if I go bool valid target, so I'm going to create a true or false value, and that is going to be equal to hit info dot collider. So I'm going to get the collider of the hit a collider of the object I hit with my Raycast, I'm going to check its tag. And I'm going to say, hey, do you equal ground? And if you do, valid target will be true. And if it doesn't, valid card target will be false. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to set our color. So we're going to say um, that the color, um, we're just going to call it line renderer color like that, is again, we're going to use that question mark operator. So we're going to say valid target. And then we're going to go question mark. So we're going to set line render color equal to valid target. If valid target is true, then we're going to set it equal to color dot cyan. So that kind of light blue color. Otherwise, we're going to set it to color dot gray. So gray color if it if it's not a valid target, blue color if it is a valid target. And now we can set the color of our line renderer. So now we can say lr dot start color equals lr color, and we could say lr dot end color equals lr color. So that just sets the start and end color of our line render to the color we want. OK, so we've turned it on. We've checked valid. We've set the color. And now we can just simply set the position. So now we can um, just set the two positions of there's two points, remember? So if I want to set the position of those two points, the first is the first point, which I want, I want the line to start at my controller. So I'm going to say index 0, programmer start at 0. So I'm going to get the very first line. Uh, very first point, and I'm going to say set position zero to uh, transform dot position. Set it to my own to my own controller, and then we're going to set uh, position number one, and we're going to set that one to the hit info dot point, right? Because that is the um, that's the point we hit. So we're going to go from our controller to the point we hit, and we're going to set both the first and second positions, and that's about it. Um, the last thing we can do is we can actually disable the line render lr.enabled equals false if it's so the case that we don't hit anything. Remember, this else statement is for if our Raycast doesn't hit anything. And so with that, let's take a look-see. We hit play. Oh, wrong control. There we go. We now have a line render showing me where I'm pointing, which makes it much nicer. And if I point at the wall, it turns gray. So I don't have a valid target that I can teleport to. So it's 
uh, an invalid target and shows gray. So again, we're adding that UX. So we're letting our user know that, hey, you can't teleport here uh, if you're pointing at somewhere where we don't want you to teleport. This can also be really helpful if you add a walkable mesh. So you add kind of a nav mesh or an area around uh, objects where you want them to teleport. So you don't even allow people to get too close, which can be another really nice uh, UX uh, option. Uh, so now what I want to do is that line renderer looks cool, but it's uh, it's really kind of straight and boring. Uh, a lot of the cool line renderers, if you go to the packages, they have curved lines. So now I want to take a little math detour, and I want to show you guys how to create a curved line. Now, how, how does that happen? Well, first of all, it works with this thing called a lerp. Uh, so a lerp is a linear interpolation, which means if you have an A value or a start value, a B value, or an N value, you give me a T value, or just a number between zero to one, and as that value increases from zero to one, I will give you the number in between that's linearly interpolated. A lerp is super powerful. We're gonna use it for the fade, and we're gonna use it for the curve. But you're gonna say, wait, but that's not a curve, that's a straight line, and that, you are right. So for a curve, we need three points like this. So if we have a start point, an end point, and some sort of midpoint, which we're gonna calculate, which is just gonna be for us halfway in between and then a little bit up. If we calculate these three points, we already have start, we already have end, let's just calculate mid, then what happens if we lerp from A to B at the same time we lerp from B to C? Or start to mid at the same time we lerp from mid to end? You're gonna say, okay, well, that still doesn't look too much like a curve. I'll say, hold on. So if we lerp from A to B and lerp from B to C, we get two moving points. But then what happens if we lerp in between the lerps? So just three lerps. So we're just gonna linearly interpolate between the two points. And that, that blue line certainly looks interesting. See what happens when he traces a line behind it of where that blue line moved. And look at that. You have a perfectly smooth curved line. So you take three points, you lerp from A to B, lerp from B to C, and then lerp from the lerps. And there you go, curved line in basically three lines. So that's what we want to create. But I want to first uh, get the midpoint. Um, so how do we get the midpoint? Well, uh, Another quick lesson, if we have a start point here, well, we'll call this, uh, if we have a, if we have a start point here, we have an end point here. Um, for those of you who don't know, final minus initial gives us the vector between. Um, so if this is uh, at position one, two, and this is position four, three, we go final minus initial. So four minus one is three and three minus one is one, we go, we end up right here. And this gives us the vector in between. You say, that's not the vector in between, but I say it is, because this vector, uh, the vector in between is right here, and this is the exact same vector. So what we can do is we can take this vector that goes in between, so start n minus start, and then we can divide it in half, so just n minus start divided by two, and then we can take this vector and add it to our start position. So we take start position, add this half vector, and there we go we got the point that's right in the middle of our start and end. And then what we're gonna do is we're just gonna add a little bit to its Y coordinate, so we just push it up a little bit. So it's just gonna be N minus start divided by two and added to start, and we get this. And then we are going to add to its Y component, and it's gonna push it up, and then we'll have our midpoint. So let's indeed create that. So what I wanna do, is I'm just gonna comment out these two lines because we are not gonna use we are not gonna use straight lines anymore. Uh, we are going to make this thing curved. So first, let's create a vector three start point like this, which we already know is our, just our transformed opposition, and let's create a vector three endpoint, which we already know is also just hit info dot point like that. And then what we want to do is we want to create a vector three uh, vec uh, from, we'll call it a vector from start to end, which is just going to be equal, as we saw, endpoint minus start point. Oops. Endpoint minus start point, like that. So now we have our we have our vector from our start to our end, and then we want to get the vector that is half of that. So we can just say half uh, vec from start to end, and that's just going to be vec from start to end divided by two. 
So I could definitely write this all in one line. I'm just writing it out to make it a little bit more clear for those of you who aren't as comfortable with a vector map. And now we want to get our midpoint. And we said our midpoint is just going to be start point uh, plus the half vector from start to end like that. And then finally, we just want to push our midpoint up so it gives us a little bit of that curve. Uh, so in order to do that, I'm going to add a variable here that's going to be a public float curve height like that, which we're going to set to 1.5 meters uh, by default. And so now I can just go to my midpoint and get its Y component and add a uh, curve height like that. So now it's pushed up. So now we have a point that's in between our start and our mid. Um, and now we just need to do our lerps. So what do we say our function was? Well, we said we need to lerp from A to B. We need to lerp from B to C and lerp here. So how does this actually work? Because our line renderer just takes a bunch of points, right? We set position, set position, set position. Well, realistically, a curve is just a bunch of points like this, right? So what we need to do is we need to supply our line renderer with as many points as we want smoothness. So the more points we give it, the smoother the line will be. Um, so what we really need is we need to, well, if we take a look at this point, how do we get this point? Well, this point is really just when t equals about 0.1. And this point is when t equals about 0.2. And this you know, right here would be t at about 0.5. So if we just use a loop and just loop through the amount of points we want, incrementing t each time, then we will get the position of all our points with that formula, two lerps into a third lerp. So that's what I'm going to do now. Again, this will all be uh, recorded. And I'll give a reference to that video as well, because it is fantastic. Fantastic. I explained everything very well. Uh, but we're just going to implement this quickly because this is a really cool uh, equation. So I'm just going to create a for loop. That's just going to be int i equals 0 to start. I want to go i less than. Now we need a line resolution. So now I need to say, how many points do I want in my line? How smooth do I want it to appear? So I'm going to say public int line resolution equals, uh, what do we want to equal? We want it to equal like maybe 20, 20 points in our line to start. I'm also going to set the position count. Uh, we now no longer have two lines. We now have line resolution amount of lines. And I want to loop for the amount of times that I have a line resolution. And then we're just going to I plus plus each uh, time. So we're going to increment I. So the first one, as we said, is going to be a vector three uh, position. This is the start to mid lerp. So this is going to equal vector three dot lerp. You'll notice the function is already here. So we're lerping from start point to midpoint based off of some t value. I'll come back to the t value in a second. And then we also want vector three uh, mid to end, which is going to equal vector three dot lerp uh, mid point to end point, like that. We'll come back to the t again. And then finally, our curved position. So our final curved position, as we saw from that equation, is just going to be vector three uh, dot lerp of start to mid, so that's our first lerp, uh, to our second lerp, mid to end, based off of t. So what is t? Well, t needs to be a 0 to 1 value. So if I have my value of i going from 0 to line resolution, uh, I can set uh, t equal to i divided by line resolution. And since this is an integer, uh, I'm just going to make sure to cast it to a float like that. And there we go. So this will give us um, zero. If we have four, uh, I will go zero out of four, one out of four, two out of four, three out of four. We'll get 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75, uh, and we'll get all our zero to one values for t. And so now we can just set our position. So now we just go lr dot set position. This time we're using i, so our index, which is going from zero to our line resolution. So index zero, index one, index two, index three. And we're going to set it to curve boss for each of them. And there we go we add ourselves a curved line. So let's go take a look. Once again, you don't have to believe me. That's fine. That's cool. Hey, that's why we do it like this. This is why I show you. I could walk away right now and do it all on trust, but we don't know each other long enough to develop that trust. So I will indeed show you instead. And look at that. We got ourselves a nice curved line. If I uh, put this headset actually on, I can actually show you in the inspector that I can change the curve height. And I can push the curve height up and the curve height down. We can change the smoothness of it. We could also change. 
reduce the resolution. So I could go to like three points and you could see it gets very blocky and actually does not work very well at all. <laughs> uh, changing the points on the fly won't be good because we actually have to initialize it. Uh, but yeah, there you go. So we got ourselves a curve line now. Um, so now uh, it's probably getting to the point where we don't just want to be sending a line off into the ether. Um, also, I just want to make a quick note. We can talk about this in the after section with the questions, but it can also be really nice to adjust that curve height dynamically on the fly. So as things get further, the curve height smooths out. And as you get closer, the curve height comes up. And again, you can do that with alert and distance checks. But in the interest of time, this UX will be good enough for us. So already our line is starting to feel much nicer, nice and smooth, nice and curved. So now what I want to do is I want to add a bit of a reticle. So with um, uh, with my class, I usually like to, at this point, introduce particle systems because that's what I do mostly for AAA games as a tech artist. Uh, but in the interest of time, we're going to do a very basic uh, reticle rather than some fancy particle system. It's just going to be a cylinder. I'm just going to use T to uh, size this down, use E to uh, make it a little bit smaller here, like that. And then we are going to simply go to materials. I'm going to right-click create a material, and we're going to call this teleporetical, like this. And I'm going to make this material um, unlit, uh, which means it's not going to have lighting, so it won't have this shadow like it does right now. And I'm also going to make it transparent. I'm also going to make it uh, cyan by just dragging R all the way down, and then drag the opacity down to like 128. So it's halfway transparent. So now when I put this on here, there we go. We got ourselves a little kind of circular teleport reticle that will uh, work for us for now. Of course, this is the part where I will say definitely feel free to dive into this project after and make this look much cooler with some particle systems and stuff. But for now, this will be good. So what we want to do is go back to the code. And we want to add a reference to that smooth reticle. So I want to say public transform. And I'm going to call this my teleport reticle, uh, like that. So now I have a reference to its uh, transform. And I mean, to be quite honest, it's going to be quite simple. All we're going to do is we are going to set, let's do it right here after we get the endpoint. Let's just set the teleport reticle dot position equal to endpoint, right? Because we just want the reticle to be right where we hit, pretty much just like that. Um, one other thing we can do is we can actually disable it when it's not supposed to be viewed. So we can say teleport reticle dot uh, game object dot set active to false like that. And I can copy that line. By the way, in Visual Studio, just hit Control C. Uh, you want anywhere on the line, you don't have to copy the whole thing. So my cursor anywhere here, Control C. I'll copy that whole line, and I can Control V right here, and I'm going to turn this true. So whenever we hit something, we'll turn on the reticle. Whenever we don't, we'll turn it off and we'll set its position to our endpoint right there. So already, uh, well, of course, I need to set the reference and drag it in. So if I go to the right controller, we now have a new section under smooth reticle, and I can drag and drop that reticle in. I can, no, no, careful, careful now, careful now. I can drag and drop that reticle in like that. There we go. And now that I have the reference to it, with the headset back on, picking up the proper controller, and oh, we're getting a problem. What is that problem we're getting? I did this last time too. I always forget this. Uh, the teleport reticle is being hit by our Raycast. Uh, this is usually a fun question I like to ask uh, if we had a bit more interaction right now, but we need to turn off. As a matter of fact, I'm just gonna remove the collider so our Raycast is not hitting our own reticle. Uh, and there we go. Now it's smoothly on the ground. Well, it's not too smooth yet. So at this point, uh, is a time where I've been programming for a while and people like to say, okay, this looks really cool, but it's so jittery and it's just shaking like crazy. And it's like, I didn't think I had arthritis, but man, damn, it's just like going all over the place. Um, it might not show up as much with the frame rate that it's capturing at, but this thing is just like, it's it's like super scared right now. It is just jittering like a monster. Uh, so how do we smooth that out? Well, we go back to math. Oh, my favorite. Uh, and we say, what is really happening? Well. We have our, you know, our reticle is at a position like this. And then on the next frame, our hand jitters so much that it ends up wanting to be all the way over here. Well, um, what's happening is velocity is just distance over time. 
So we're perceiving that this thing is moving really fast because look at this distance that it's covering in just one frame. So what we need to do is reduce that distance so it doesn't travel nearly as far. Um, so what we can do is quite simply, we use our math again to say, well, let's get this desired position minus this one to get the vector to it uh, that we want to move. And let's just, you know, for now, let's say, let's divide it in half. Let's make it half of that distance. So it only travels this far um, and add that to our position. So rather than going straight here, let's get our current position and add half the vector. And then on the next frame, when you want to go over here, let's add half the vector and then half the vector and then half vector, half, half, half. So if we always add half, what's going to happen? Our distance uh, that we're traveling is going to go from here to here to here. And our distance is going to go slower and slower. It's still over one frame each time, which means this equation is going to perceive a slower and slower velocity like that. So we'll see up here as if it's smoothing out, if it's slowing down. And that is exactly what we're about to do. So I'm going to set a smoothness value because uh, we're going to use this to divide. I'm going to set the smoothness value of the public flow. Uh, smoothness value, maybe 0 0.2F. And then we are going to smooth it out. So rather than setting my endpoint directly to this position, let's first um, call this, this is my desired position. This is where I would like to go right now. Uh, so let's instead, um, rather than going straight to desired position, let's smooth it out. So let's go vector three. We'll say, let's get the vector to our desired position, vector to desired. And let's set that equal to desired. Uh, let's set that equal to, oh, I just called this desired. Let's call this desired point. That is just going to be desired point minus the point we're already at. What's the point we're already at? Uh, teleport reticle dot position, right? Because our reticle is at the position. That's, we're basically moving our reticle. So the position we were at last frame is wherever the teleport uh, reticle is right now, because this is coming through on a new frame. So we're going to get the vector from where our reticle is to where we want it to go. And then we're going to create a smooth version of that. So the vector three smoother vec to desired is just going to be basically a smaller one. So it's going to be vec to desired divided by our smoothness value. Uh, like that. And we're also going to multiply this by time dot delta time just to make it frame rate independent. That's why my smoothness value is so small. Usually it'd be like divided by 10 or divided by five. But since we're also multiplying by a super small time dot delta time to keep it frame rate independent, uh, we need to make that smoothness value a little bit smaller uh, so that it's the same experience for everybody. And now we can say our vector three endpoint equals wherever our teleport um, reticle position was before plus our smoother uh, vec to desired like that. And now rather than going immediately there, we're taking a smaller step there. Um, and with that, we once again should have more UX, more functionality, more awesome, more fun, more money because more people buy our project now because it's nice and smooth. And look at that, no movement, awesome. Awesome feel. Beautiful, beautiful, nice and smooth lurping. Love it. All right. So the very last thing I want to do um, before we run out of time is when we teleport right now, it's boom, it's instant. And in fact, you can see that right now with the smooth reticle. Uh, there's a slight problem uh, with what we're doing. Since our smooth reticle has to catch up to us, uh, you might be able to see this every time I teleport you can kind of see the reticle come out from behind me because it needs to smoothly lurk from uh, behind me where it used to be. And now we've just made this massive jump. And so it has to catch up. Uh, so the other thing, so that's one reason why we don't really want to show that. Another reason why we don't want to show that is because snapping somebody around in VR like that can be very nauseating for people. So we always want to reduce motion sickness because it's like the number one concern for VR developers uh, or complaints, all right? So what's one thing we can do? we can hide it from you. We can just not show it to you. So we're going to fade to black and it's going to make it feel so much better. So uh, this is the last thing we'll do for today. So I'm going to go to my VR head and I'm going to very simply add a UI a raw image. Just, just the quickest way I found to do it. And I'm just going to set this canvas to a world space canvas. And then uh, let's take a look at our game. And I'm going to set the size to nice and small. So 0 0.001, 0 0.001, and 0 0.001. Uh, 
Uh, that's not 0 0.0001. There it is. And let's reset the position to 0, 0, 0. So there is our canvas. And then let's put it 0.1, uh, so right in front of the camera like that. And then we're basically just going to make this a completely black screen like this. Now, you'll notice it's uh, rendering on top of this. This is because of the transparent queue and stuff like that with shaders. So to fix that, I'm just going to go to a material. I'm going to create, uh, we'll call this black screen. And I want to just call this a default uh, sprite. I'm going to set the render queue to, uh, well, let's actually add this. Uh, add this material right here to my raw image. So I'm going to add this to the black screen. And now when we change the materials render order in the render queue to something like 4,000, it hides it and renders on top. So that just fixes that little issue with the transparency. And now, of course, I'm going to come here, shift, hold, shift, and hold, alt, command, or shift and option on Mac. And it's going to make uh, this screen the full size. And now, as you can see, if I fade this out, and fade it in, we get our fade to black and our fade out to, from black. Uh, and so the last thing we want to add in the code is uh, a, a little um, coroutine. Uh, so coroutines are great ways to do things over multiple frames. And so what I'm going to do is add a fade screen. Uh, I'm going to have a reference to a UI image. So I need to add the UI library uh, because UI doesn't come by default in the standard Unity uh, frameworks. So I'm going to add UI up top. And this is just going to be a public raw image. And we're going to call this black screen like this. And so now we have a reference to the uh, black screen raw image. And now we want to create our coroutine. So we can see I already have the coroutine here. And look at that. Someone was so nice. Wow, someone already added all the comments for us so we can keep track of what's going on. Wasn't that nice of them? I wanted to do that for this one, but I felt since we are doing it in steps, it would have made it a little bit confusing if I showed you all this curve, um, if I showed you all the comments for the curve while we we're still working on straight lines. Uh, but for this one, to make it a little bit simpler, uh, we're just going to add these things. So first of all, First things first, we need um, a Boolean uh, to keep track of. We want to make sure we're not calling this teleport. We're not like doing multiple teleports while we're fading in and fading out, since it's not instant anymore. So I'm going to add an internal uh, value. Uh, that's just going to be a public bool. Um, we'll call it teleport lock, just to make sure that uh, teleportation can stay locked um, when we're uh, in the middle of teleporting. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to set teleport lock equal to true as soon as we start. And then next, we are going to set a counter. So I'm going to say float current time equals, equals zero. Now, we want to loop until that counter is done. So I'm going to go while current time is less than one. Um, boom, uh, like uh, this. And then our fade out screen. So now we want to fade out our screen. So I'm just going to get the black screen dot color, and I'm going to set it to one of our favorite functions, color.lerp. And we are going to lerp from color.clear to color.black based off of current time, which as you can see is a value that starts at zero and goes to one. So that's going to lerp our color from black clear to black. So it's going to fade it out, essentially. Now we want to wait one frame. When we're in a coroutine, in order to wait one frame and come back here next frame, we can just go yield return null like that. And then we want to increment our timer. So now we can go current time plus equals time dot delta time. Delta time is a time that's passed in between each frame. So we're just adding that to our timer. So how much time has it been since we waited one frame? And then we're going to loop again. And so this is going to keep adding. Basically, this is going to last one second. Uh, so now we can set our black screen dot color just because the lerp doesn't always end perfectly at the exact value we want it. We're just going to make sure to hard set our color to black now, since we've waited one full second and it's faded out, and now we will move our user. So in fact, we actually want to pass in our position because we're in a different scope, we're in a different function. So we have our position passed in here. And so now we're going to move our user here instead with the XR rig transform dot position equals pos, the position that was passed in. Um, we're going to wait one second. So we're going to fade to black, wait a second on black, and then fade back in. So to wait one second, we can just go yield, return, new, wait four seconds like this and just wait for one second. And now we want to reset our timer because we're about to fade back again. So we're going to set current time to zero and then we're going to do it all over again. We're just going to go while current time is less than one. We're going to open up our brackets 
and we're going to fade again. So we're just going to go, uh, in fact, we're so much going to fade again that I'm just going to copy this line like that. But this time we're going the opposite way. So this time we're going from color.black to color.clear to fade it back out or fade it back in, depending on how you how you look at it. Yield, return, no. Uh, so we're going to wait one frame and then increment our timer. Current time plus equals time dot delta time like that. And last but not least, we are going to allow teleporting again. So teleport lock equals uh, false. I just had this here, so we didn't have an error. We don't need that anymore. And there we go. So now we just want to use this call this function and use the teleport lock, and we're done. So here, this input dot trigger. So so far, we've been allowing the trigger to be pressed and you to teleport whenever you want, as long as you hit something. But we just want to add a little bit to this. So we just want to say, hey, you can only teleport if teleport lock equals true and um, valid target equals true. So if you have a valid target and teleport lock, oh, teleport lock equals false, sorry, the teleport is not locked. So as long as teleport is not locked, because as soon as it starts, it's going to lock teleport, then you can do this. And instead of um, calling this, we're instead going to start our coroutine, which is going to be fade teleport is what we called it. We're going to pass in our hit info dot point. Oops. Hit info dot point, which is the position we want to teleport to. We don't need this anymore. Uh, so we'll comment that out. And there we go. We are all done. But of course, before I invite Steph back, for the last time, you don't have to trust me. You really don't. I understand. You and I, we haven't made the connection yet. Uh, you, you, you just don't know. Am I a swindler? Am I am I selling you snake oil of code? No. I will, I will show you as one final time that if we pass in our raw image, we actually be a little bit organized and we call this black screen. Now our right controller has a reference to our black screen. We can most certainly, one final time, show you that I'm not lying when I say the code I have written allows us to teleport with a fade to black and fade back in. And ooh, does it feel so nice. It does feel pretty good, I must say. So I would love to answer all your questions uh, because I'm sure you have a bunch. Uh, and I would love to invite Steph back because I do believe we are done. Mm. Let's see. Oh, Let's... Oh. Can you oh my hat is all messed up. Oh, all the VR and, uh, and the headphones. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Tyrell, thank you so, so much for showing us how to kickstart VR locomotion in your, your own very, very own VR project. Really do appreciate it. Now, we did fly through this content fairly quickly. We only did have about an hour and a half here, but what I'm gonna do is I'm going to um, wrap it up for, for about five minutes here, uh, offering you some resources and next steps if you're interested in taking this further. And then we'll bring back Tatrell here to help answer some of the questions we have hanging around in the questions tab. But before I do do that, I'm gonna toss in a poll here. And if you could all let me know who are currently still with us, on a scale of zero to 10 on this poll that I send out, how likely are you to recommend this workshop to someone else? Zero being you wouldn't tell anyone about it or recommend it. 10 being you would recommend it. It, it helps us judge whether or not we should continue doing these free workshops and webinars about certain topics in AR, VR. But do let me know in the chat there whether or not this was helpful, if you would recommend it to anyone else. It, it really means a lot to us. But um, let's, uh, let's, let's get going here. So um, again, we've had people join us from all walks of life to dive into this a little bit further. And we did flew, fly through this very, very quickly. Now, again, people come from all walks of life to learn more about this. And you can do so much with this technology that uh, we have various success stories coming out of our program from Mike Oaks taking our course and now landed a job with Unity themselves to work with them. We had Jennifer Swan take our program over the summer as well. And after taking our course and the project she built out with the support of our team, she got accepted into Oculus's Launchpad program with the project we supported her on. And she received funding to continue working on her project with the support of Oculus there. 
Now, we also had Matt Delalo uh, recently do an info session with us about our program. And his story was taking the Circuit Stream course and now works with a uh, VR studio, Lucky VR, mainly doing some gambling and poker, uh, virtual reality scenarios and experiences. But if you're ever interested in learning more, let us know. We'd be more than happy to help out. Now, again, there's two kind of main ways that, that we've helped these people learn how to develop these experiences themselves. We have our flagship XR development with Unity program. This is beginner friendly for those of you who marked yourselves as a zero, one, or two in that poll we sent out recently. It's 10 weeks long, four hours per week. Three of those hours are in class and each student gets a private weekly one-on-one -on -one session to work on their personal project with the support of instructors like Tyrell here. Now the next course starts on February 15th and the deadline to register is actually this Friday. Um, if, if, if it's too tight for you, we do have one following on April 27th. We hold it throughout the year, every two, two and a half months or so. So lots of opportunities to join us. But if you wanna get into it before the spring, I would say apply on our website, reach out to one of the reps, myself or Kyle, who, who you've seen in the chat there, and we'd be more than happy to help you out. Now, we just recently announced the bundle for a single registration of our program. It includes this beginner-friendly course, the 10-week XR Development with Unity program, a C-sharp short course to help you prepare uh, for, for this, whether it's brushing up on your C-sharp skills or making you more confident. And we send out an Oculus Quest 2 headset with the full enrollment of our program. Um, and it's $39.50 here. Now, for those of you who are, let's say, more interested in, in this and a specific short course for the Quest, for the HoloLens, um, XR Design, we have our Starter Pack Plus as well for $44.50, which includes those three and an additional short course as well. So feel free to reach out to any of us and we'd be more than happy to help. Now, for this course specifically, you'll learn how to use Unity to make AR and VR apps. We'll also cover C Sharp fundamentals. You've seen quite a bit here today with Tyrell. And again, four hours of class per week over 10 weeks with support on your own ideas and projects. So you have something to add to your portfolio by the end. There's no experience required. So beginners have no fear. We welcome everyone from all walks of life. Start off slow and get deeper and deeper into it. Now, like hardware, I get that question a lot. A Mac or a PC will do, the PCs are better tailored towards this. Um, and if you're looking to create a mobile experience, an Android or an iPhone will do just fine for that. Now, no matter what headset you'd like to develop for, if it's the Oculuses, the HTCs, maybe even some AR ones like the HoloLens or Magic Leap, we're, we're more than happy to get going and help you create something for those. Now, for those of you who marked yourselves as a five plus in Unity, um, we do have our XR Project Accelerator program for those who are already familiar with all of this. And it's to advance your skills in the design development side of things, really accelerating your ideas and projects with the support of instructors like Tyrell. It's five hours of class per week over eight weeks, and you do get private sessions to accelerate that idea and project of yours. The next course is on March 1st, also held every two, two and a half months or so, and the full price of that is $44.50. But we also announced the bundle for the Accelerator Program and Pack for those of you who are more experienced in this. It's our XR Project Accelerator course, C-sharp short course if you wanted to brush up on some things, and an Oculus Quest 2 headset that we send out. And the plus is that we'll also add a short course. So if you're working on the Quest HoloLens or more on the design side of things, we'd be more than happy to have you with us and support those projects. Now we do have payment plans and financing options in place as well. You can split it up into three months, six months, or over the year, 12 month payment plans. Now, if you're interested in learning more, please download a syllabus at circuitstream.com slash learning. Or if you wanna dive into it right away before the registration of the 10 week course, the deadline this Friday, feel free to apply it there as well. Now, one last thing I forgot to mention is that we do also do private team trainings for individuals, colleagues, groups that want to dive into it with some other of their friends or, or co-workers. Uh, we've had the pleasure to have the U.S. Navy, 
Walmart and various others with us uh, in these private training sessions where we tailor the content and schedule to fit your means there. And again, feel free to reach out to myself, to my colleague Kyle, who's in the chat there. Uh, we're more than happy to offer any insight we can to advise you on whether or not it's a good fit. Um, so please don't hesitate to reach out with any questions that you may have. But with that, we do have about 10, 15 minutes here to get into those questions in the question and answer tab. So I'm going to uh, increase your screen here, Tyrell, just because you're the you're probably going to be leading most of these questions. Um, but let's see, let's see. So um, I'm just going through the unanswered ones first. Sure. Uh, and I have one here from Roberto. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to toss it open here for you, uh, Tyrell. Uh, Roberto's asking, can VR controller movement be linked to emotion, eye tracking, or gestures tracked by the headset cameras for a bit more human walking in game without actually walking out of game? So linked to emotion and eye tracking. So that's interesting. So uh, eye tracking is a thing that we can do and have been able to do for a while. I haven't seen it implemented in any sort of uh, used for any sort of input mechanic, but that actually sounds pretty interesting. Uh, maybe a game that's based off of your eyes or you could actually look and shoot or do something like that. I don't know how well it would work for movement, uh, but that's quite interesting because your eyes probably wander a little bit more than you uh, recognize. In terms of uh, like emotion or gesture tracking, I feel you would have to get into uh, machine learning in order to really dive into being able to, because we only have three points to track, right? We can do a lot uh, based off of that. Um, but we only track uh, the left hand, the right hand, rotation position, and the head rotation and position. So to um, kind of uh, infer emotion out of that, I feel is only something a computer uh, trained with a bunch of machine learning would be able to do, like check, tell if somebody's slouching or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, st uh, still not sure how that would tie into an input mechanic for uh, movement. Um, but uh, it's definitely interesting in terms of, yeah, taking a look at a bunch of different, basically a much higher degree of fidelity gesture recognition tool uh, that you tie into the input mechanic. I honestly think there are a lot of cool applications that you could use that for. I'm just not sure if locomotion would be the one for it. I mean, it's still pretty um, relaxing to like sit down. Like I actually, to be honest, I play these days vast majority of the VR games and experiences I do, I do sitting down. Even the ones that are meant to be standing up because it's just so much more comfortable to sit down uh, while you play. Uh, so it's really not that bad to like have the movement controls on your hand with a little joystick and just move around once you get used to it or with the teleport movement uh, like we've been doing. Um, so that's what I would say to that. Perfect, awesome. And yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I'm, I'm typically the same way as well, Tyrell. Mm -hmm. uh, now we have one here from Mert. And Mirth is asking, do you have experience with AR Foundation? He's trying to build multiple image tracking on it via Unity. So just briefly, um, any maybe resources we could direct him to, we're more than happy to follow up with you as well, Mirth, after this, so we can cover it in, in more depth with you. For sure. I know uh, as the, the team, uh, as far as the team goes, I do have experience with AR Foundation, pretty much all things Unity, but I know Nikisa uh, is one of the best AR um, yeah. people we have on the team who does a lot of things with HoloLens and AR Foundation. Um, so I'm sure Steph, as he mentioned in uh, day on in the chat, will be able to direct you some to some resources for AR Foundation, which yes, now can do image tracking. So no more with the crashy euphoria. We can AR <laughs> Foundation all the way. Woo, perfect. <laughs> and uh, then we have here from Matt Andrews. Matt's asking, did the float work like a ternary operator in other languages? Um, yes, I think I actually discovered it in other languages. Swift, my absolute favorite language uh, in iOS development programming. Just a joy, absolute joy to work in. And I think that's where I first uh, discovered the ternary operator. Blew my mind. Now it basically condenses six lines. If this, or you create the bool, if this bool equals this, then do that. If this bool equals that, do that. I just do it all in one line. Uh, Swift I does it a lot. I'm pretty sure, although the question mark they use for optionals, so I might be thinking about something else. But yeah, it works these days. A lot of the, like I know like seven or eight programming languages now, but I feel like I really just know one. I mean, the syntax differs minorly, but these days they've added like every 
pretty much all the features that are in one programming language are in the other. So uh, you can switch back and forth pretty easily with like a few minor syntax things. Like I still have to look online for like, uh, what's the syntax for like C sharp array or Python array? Because I have so many different like small little syntax differences in my head, but they, they mostly all do the same thing these days. Perfect, perfect. Now we did answer this question from uh, Kristen earlier. Jerry actually answered it, but if you wanted to touch up on it a little bit as well, that'd be great. Uh, she was asking, is this better than using teleportation provider or just to understand how this works behind the scenes? Um, it depends. I think uh, there's pros and cons. I think oftentimes, like I set this up in, as you saw, 50 minutes and there's 100 lines. If you go with a, um, with a plugin, you have like 2,000 lines, right? Or more and tons of scripts, tons of things to sift through and you have to do things in their way. Like if you want uh, maybe a sound to happen during a teleport, you'd have to dive into like 2,000 lines of code to find where the event happens for on teleportation, which can be really hard to find sometimes because oftentimes plugins are a lot more complex than they actually need to be for the functionality that you're looking for because they need to be so general. They need to work for this headset, for that headset, for this situation, for that situation. So there's a whole bunch of guard code and there's a whole bunch of um, a lot of things to handle those situations. So oftentimes, if you know you need a very specific feature or you know you need very custom features, like you wanna add sounds or you wanna add maybe your health decreases every time you teleport or you have a certain amount of them, sometimes it is a lot easier. And in fact, I would highly recommend better to just implement it uh, yourself uh, so you have access to everything you need. You can customize it, it's lightweight. Um, things are simple in the inspector, like as you saw from uh, my screen, like. Um, the code or the inspector has like five variables that we set in. Most of those plugins have just tons. So it can just be confusing. So it's up to you. Uh, also, the more familiar you get with the plugins, the easier it is to work with them. So the less that argument becomes a thing, but the more restricted you are to doing things in their way, and the deeper you get into it, the more you'll start to realize like, oh, they're doing it in a very specific way, which may or may not be conducive to what you want to do. So basically, as all horrible answers, it depends. <laughs> No, that helped a lot. And Jerry did add some insight there as well. I appreciate it. Thank you, Tyrell. And we have another one here from Roberto. And Roberto's asking, in certain games where the player's character get, can get dazed, dizzy, drunk, does teleportation negate those effects? Or would it put a put at a cone of Raycast and randomly chooses which one to go to? Um, so uh, it, it depends on... That's more of a design question, I would say um, when you, for a VR game that makes you drunk and goes to different locations, yeah, it definitely could be doing a uh, cone of Raycast, but um, more likely, oh, what more likely what it would do is instead of doing a cone of Raycast like that, it would start the Raycast pointing straight and then it would rotate it uh, randomly uh, just a little bit, just like you only need five degrees or so of rotation and now instead of going straight, it would hit something over here. So you teleport a little bit this way or that way or that way. So that's how I would give the effect of kind of a little bit of not perfectly accurate uh, teleportation and to give those drunk effects or dazed and dizzy. Um, yeah, similar thing with putting something in front of the canvas and putting a filter on that, a blurry filter, a Gaussian blur or something like that uh, can really give uh, that effect off pretty well for sure. Right on. Yeah, I was super curious about this question as well. Great question, Roberto. I liked it. Um, so here's one from Matt. And we do have about 10 minutes left for everyone in the audience here, but I think we can get yeah. through everything. Keep on um, rolling. So this one's from Matt. Matt's asking, why did you use float data type for an integer when the return value was a whole number? Um, so let's see what you are talking about. So if I share my screen, let's see. So sorry, locomotion. So why did you use a float data type uh, for an integer when the return value was a whole number? Uh, you must be talking about, because we don't have anything here. I think you must be talking about um, this right here for the line resolution. Uh, why did I use a, because um, this is the only place we have float. Um, yeah, this is the only place we have floats in the uh, code other than smooth this value, but that needed to be a float. So you must be talking about uh, this one. So the reason why I use the float here is because um, T, 
Uh, this lerp expects a, well, a lerp expects a float. So it expects your initial vector, your final vector, and then your t value, which is a zero to one value. And since it's zero to one, it means it's a decimal number. So it has to be a float. So this t value has to be a float. So why did I make this one an integer rather than, um, uh, rather than just making it a float? It's because I'm using it right here. And I'm using it uh, right here. So because uh, position count expects uh, because position count expects an int, so the, the total number of uh, points I want in my line, I want that to be an integer. I don't want somebody to type in like 5.6 uh, uh, numbers, because then I'd have to like round this or convert this to an int, and that would be weird. And it would also look weird to if um, you started to drag it, because uh, the other problem is even if um, we, even if you know to put an integer in here, if it's a full, if it's an integer, um, like, if you wanted to drag this, you'll notice when I drag it, it still gives me whole numbers. But if I drag the float like this, it gives me decimal numbers. So if I just wanted to quickly test like I was like, oh, let's just drag this down and see less points or more points, it still gives me whole numbers rather than giving me floats. Uh, so that's one reason why, well, it's one of the main reasons why this is an integer. And then we also used it in the for loop, uh, which usually also expects integers as well. And so this is the only place we use it here. So I just converted it to a float at this point because now it needs to go into our T value. Um, so that's what the plan was. I hope that's the uh, uh, float and int conversion that you were talking about. Yeah, it looks like it. Uh, he just said, oh no, so that this was Matt's question. My apologies, that's Roberto mm -hmm. in the chat. Well, we'll see. Matt, feel free to reach out if there's anything else you'd like to, uh, us to clarify on. Perfect, so uh, next question from uh, Mr. Ralph. So Ralph is asking, where can we follow you, Tyrell, and follow up? Would your tutorial here uh, smoothly work with the Oculus Quest uh, hand tracking API? Um, yeah, the only thing that, well, I guess you can follow me at uh, twitch.tv slash black tie event. I wear a tie every stream, have a lot of fun. Been blowing up the last week. I've been doing <laughs> a whole bunch of chess streams and my channel has doubled in size in the past week. So now we consistently get double digit viewers. It is uh, <laughs> it is quite fun. And yeah, I do dev streams. In fact, I'm about to do a uh, dev stream later today. I'm gonna finish up a game that we're putting out on Steam. Uh, so yeah, you can come check me out there. I do lots of fun dev streams and chess and gaming and all kinds of stuff, um, but uh, the other question was, would this work for hand tracking? Um, 100% it would, uh, because the only thing uh, relative to controllers here is simply um, transforms, uh, right? We we can attach this, we can literally attach this script to anything. Um, the only, so, um, and even with Oculus hand tracking, you'll have a root uh, transform position for your hand, so the line renderer could still come out of your hand. The only thing you would need to change is the, um, is the input. Uh, so when we do um, rotation here, uh, I don't have visual assist on anymore. Oops. When we have rotation here, uh, this input.get button down and this input.get axis, you would have to change to one of the gesture recognition things uh, or even this um, input.get button down trigger. So you'd have to change that to like the pinch recognition and stuff like that. But um, uh, besides those inputs, all the rest of this code would work because it's it's all just working based off of these two values right here: transform.position and transform.forward, and that's where our raycast starts, and that's where it all begins. Uh, so yeah, you would have access to both of those things with hand tracking as well. Perfect, awesome. Thank you, Tyrell. And we got a question here from Mr. Tom. Tom's asking how to handle the rotation of the player after they land. Oh, this is a very good one. Yeah, I saw this one in the uh, chat. How to handle and how to turn them in a certain direction based on where they land. So this one uh, with my company, Elucidity, this was actually a big UX feature that I added a little while back that helps so much. So in so first of all, first of all, when you're teleporting, when the when you allow the user to manually teleport, I don't think it's a good idea to automatically rotate them. I think it's only a good idea to automatically rotate them if you are snapping them to a position uh, and there's a specific point of interest or if you are manually teleporting them yourselves. But if you're letting them freely teleport, I think it's a bad idea to change the rotation because that will really disorient someone. So I've worked with this feature in two projects. One is my VR baseball project, which is actually what I made back when I first joined this course 
<laughs> way back uh, and got me my Unity scholarship uh, or GDC scholarship and uh, stuff like that. Uh, and in that game, I had all kinds of crazy uh, UX to deal with with rotation because I made you you were both the pitcher, and then when you threw the ball, you I snapped you to the batter, and you could bat the ball, and then I snapped you to the fielder, and then you could catch the ball, and you could throw it to the second baseman and switch you. So just thinking about that, there's like big 180-degree rotations every time you switch. And at the beginning, before I got the UX down, that was really disorienting to people. Uh, so what you have to be really careful with is when you do manually rotate someone, make sure they are expecting it, or make sure uh, that if you do it, they didn't even know it happened. So when you teleport, like, because if they know it happened, so if they're teleporting themselves and they see they're pointing forward, they see a door in front of them and then they teleport and then they see like the door beside them, that will mess them up, right? Because they felt they moved forward and now they're rotated, that will mess them up. Uh, but if you, um, if you have a moment in your game where it's like, okay, time to go to the next room and you go to another room that they've never even seen before and all of a sudden um, they're manually rotated looking at the centerpiece of the room, they won't even know uh, what happened, right? Or if when we throw a ball, um, they expect to see that ball. If we uh, teleport them and they're now looking at that ball, everything is expected. We're not putting them at weird rotations. Um, so I, it really comes down to the user expectation, doing it yourself, not taking control away from the user. You wanna be very careful about taking control away from the user, because that's when things get weird. Um, so in terms of how to do it, it would just basically be uh, right at the end here. So um, we also doing it behind a black screen is very good. You'll notice that's what we did. We waited to actually move the user until our screen was completely black and then we faded back in and boom, they're in a new position. So no worry about um, disorientation or movement or acceleration. It's just they click a button, things go away. When they come back, we're in a new spot. So this is where I would do the rotation and I would do the same thing. I would do like XR rig dot, um, uh, XR rig dot look at and I would pass in the position you want to look at. So if you had, you know, some cool objects transform uh, like that, uh, you could do that. And as soon as they come back in, it would be looking at that very cool objects transform because it would have been rotated. To make sure that it doesn't roll or bend, you could also pass in vector three dot up. Uh, to make sure that it stays facing straight up. And this is giving me a red because I obviously don't have some cool objects transform because I'm not that cool of a guy yet. Uh, but if I was a very cool guy and I had some cool objects transform, then this would rotate the user after uh, the teleport. And uh, I think that would answer your question. Perfect, right on. So we got about four minutes here to get through. It looks like uh, six questions or so. So apologies if we don't get to it. Um, but here's one from Stu. Stu was asking, knowing that there are apps like uh, BZ Fit that use Bluetooth sensors for locomotion. Is there the ability to do this in Unity? Do you know? Oh, yes. So I work with Unreal very often in um, game in, uh, in AAA uh, gaming. Uh, and I get the question all the time, Unity Unreal, Unity Unreal. This is one thing that Unity is fantastic at. Uh, Unity is fantastic at um, uh, working with multiple things. They are like the one of the absolute best cross-platform software there is out there. Develop once works on anything. So 100% there are APIs and there are plugins and there are toolkits and there's just some C-sharp call that you can make uh, that will be able to talk to Bluetooth. I remember Jason, one of the original instructors who taught me, uh, uh, one of my best colleagues in this industry, uh, I remember often going to his office over the summer and he was doing these weird Unity contracts working for this like Motorola phone that's like eight years old for some company or some device. And yeah, you could do all kinds of, talk to all kinds of devices and objects in Unity, set up your own Raspberry Pis and do all kinds of cool uh, things as well. So 100%, uh, you could very, uh, get that up and running in a program like Unity, uh, no problem. Perfect, gotta love Unity, gotta love Unity. Thanks gotta for that question there. Uh, perfect, then we've got probably time to answer two, three more questions here. So the next one I have is from Reed. Reed's asking, does spatial audio engineering connected to movement in VR have the potential to reduce motion sickness? Oh, indeed. So motion sickness, what is motion sickness? Motion sickness is your inner ear telling you that's not right. Motion sickness is your entire life. When you've seen something, uh, you felt it. When you tilt your head to the left, 
uh, your the fluid in your inner ears feels that tilt and feels this tilt. And uh, that's why um, when in VR, we make you move, but your ears don't feel that motion, don't feel that movement, or even worse, if you tilt your head and the frame rate is so slow that it takes a little while for that view to correct and your eyes aren't matching up with your ears, done, you're done, you're, the nausea is coming. Uh, so uh, there have been a lot of experiments and I've heard that it's actually getting pretty far, um, that yes, there are special headphones uh, that will try to uh, cover your ears in a very specific way and talk to you, send vibrations and pulses to your bones and create a pressure and a whole bunch of engineering and science. I'm, I'm just a programmer, right? Uh, but yes, there is some very cool technologies being developed in research labs right now uh, that boasts the ability to do that and help with that. But even better, not only help with nausea, but also enhance the experience. Now, uh, it's not just about, once you get to that point, excuse me, it won't be just about um, helping you not feel sick in standard experiences. It will help you, it will help augment uh, those experiences. So now we can really make you feel like you're flying left and flying right and will feel awesome because, you know, you'll feel like you're actually moving and you're actually tilting and flying. Uh, so yeah, I'll definitely a very cool thing with uh, some audio and sensory stuff with your ear, messing with that with pressures and vibrations, uh, 100%. Perfect. Awesome. Thanks, Tyrell. And so we do have uh, time for just one last question here. So Alan, Euro, Roberto, my apologies. We'll take down these questions and be sure to, to answer them for you right after this workshop and webinar. But the last question that we have time for is from Ash. Just briefly asking, how do you see the future of VR development on Blender? Oh, Blender. We get this question all the time. So the, well, Blender is coming up more and more and more uh, because it is just freaking amazing. I mean, how amazing is it? Well, as I'm talking about how amazing Blender is, I type in Blender and look at that. The program is already open, ready to go. Have you ever seen any program? Word documents don't open that fast. I'm already in here and I can start modeling and adding. It's just insane. Uh, so Blender is a fantastic program. What can you not do in this program? You can model, you can model, you can sculpt, you can edit UVs, you can paint, you can shade and create all kinds of awesome textures and rendering, and you can create your own textures with procedural textures. You can, uh, you can script, you can, there's a Python script here. You can script everything inside of here. You can animate, you can rig, you can composite. It's a video editor. You can like premiere and final cut. Uh, you can set like, everything 2d it has a grease pencil you can draw in 2d and do 2d animations and it's all free it's all open source uh and it's absolutely incredible um so uh it's on its way uh me and well one of the guys i work with 20-year veteran he was one of the founding members at bioware was one of the original six in the basement uh of bioware when it was still just you know couple dudes in the basement uh, and Alberta has been at EA lead producer of or lead art director of uh, Hot Pursuit 2 and Need for Speeds and Baldur's Gate. So a huge guy managing 200 person teams. I work with him at Elucidity as my main partner right now. Um, and he has been a Max user, um, 3DS Max and Autodesk user for the past 20 years, right? Like literally 20 years before I was even born, he's been using those programs and he is 100% hundred and thousand percent on blender he is the big like you would if you ever met the guy you would think that blender is paying him to do the amount of advertising and say oh you know what blender you know what max doesn't do blender if you can do this so he's convinced me blender is incredible and i would say a hundred percent the future is huge with this they actually used to have a game engine in here as well they took that out and converted it to another real-time renderer uh but there's scripting coming so there isn't um like default VR things uh, in Blender right now, but there is an amazing community. Um, I mean, Blender, the other amazing thing about Blender is it's like Unity where you don't, it's just so widely used these days that you don't even have to type in the word Blender. If you have a question, you just type in your question and top five answers are all Blender. Same thing happens with Unity. Uh, so the community is huge. Uh, so a hundred percent, I bet you it would not be too fine, uh, too fine to hard, <laughs> too hard to find uh, some add-ons uh, online that give you all kinds of VR support. Uh, so I bet you it's coming. And if it's not, I mean, it's open source. It's Python. Hey, we'll add it together. We'll do it on stream, and uh, there can totally be some really awesome things because I've seen some really cool tools for VR 
uh, modeling and texturing and sculpting. Uh, VR sculpting is actually a, a real thing uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, so 100%, I could see that being added to Blender because it's huge. Like all the big companies are going into it. Like Unreal has invested millions, Unity has invested, and um, Microsoft has invested. Apple, I think, invested. Uh, all the big studios, the biggest animation studio in Japan is fully Blender now. Big Hero 6. And so everybody's using Blender. Everybody's converting to Blender and investing in it. So 100%, it's there for the future. Got to give a shout out to Blender. My uh, friend Russell would be proud. I just broadcasted that message to many people. <laughs> Well, hey, thanks so much there, Tyrell. So uh, that, that's all the time we have for all the questions. And Alan, Euro, Roberto, Tom, we'll be sure to take these down and reach back out to you. But for everyone still here, thank you so much for joining us on this VR Locomotion Workshop. Tyrell, thank you so, so much for answering all these questions and showing us how to kickstart a project that includes the VR Locomotion. Um, again, if there's any questions we could ever help out uh, with anyone here, Please don't hesitate to reach out to myself, to my colleague, uh, Kyle, any of our other team members here. We'd be more than happy to help. Uh, but in the meantime, I wish you all a wonderful Wednesday, maybe even Thursday on your end, and uh, a great end to the week here. Hope to catch you on our next workshop and webinar. And as always, we're here to help to support you with any questions you may have. So have a wonderful day, evening, night, morning, depending on where you are. Hope to see you all again soon. And thanks again for joining us. Take care, everyone.